Welcome to Books of Our Time, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. Today we shall discuss Team of Rivals, a book which describes Abraham Lincoln and his cabinet. The book's author is one of America's most widely read historians, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Ms. Goodwin today is with me for the first of two times to discuss her book, and I am Lawrence R. Velvel, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Doris, thank you very much. Oh, you didn't very have welcome. to come far, but we're glad that you came from, thank you. from close by. Doris, the book is a fascinating, utterly fascinating 750 page read, chock full of information. But being 750 pages, uh, there's an awful lot that we cannot discuss. So we're not going to discuss some of the things that people know about the Gettysburg Address, the first and second inaugurals, the Trent Affair, uh, things like Lincoln and McClellan, that kind of thing. But we're going to try and discuss more a lot of the things that people don't know, which are brought out in the book and which are absolutely fascinating, and I think people should know. So let's start uh, then, if, if I may, with what uh, one might call Lincolnography, the state of uh, knowledge and writing about Lincoln today. People often say, somebody said to me just a few days ago, gee, Lincoln in the Civil War, that's 150 years ago. We know everything there is to know about that, and everything's been... Not true at all. And your book is an example of the fact that it's not true at all. Can you, here's a good word for you, can you expatiate on that a little bit? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Ida Tarbell, the historian at the turn of the 20th century, said the reason there's so many books on Lincoln is because he's so companionable, so people want to live with him. So I think there's a whole group of Lincoln scholars out there who are now each year producing new information about Lincoln, about his legal career, about his earlier days, about Ann Rutledge. And when I started, all I knew was that I wanted to live with him. And I wasn't sure I could come up with a new angle. But as I got into the lives of these characters who surrounded him in the cabinet, I realized, God, they're interesting. Yeah. And they had all kept diaries and wrote letters. So that did produce a wealth of information about Lincoln through them. Yeah, and about their families and about they themselves. How did you happen to get the idea to do it this way, to look at Lincoln through, in part, the eyes of the cabinet members. It took a while. I mean, I think the book itself took 10 years, and yes. it was into about the second year. At first, I thought I was going to do Abe and Mary Lincoln, like I had done Eleanor and Franklin. Yes. But then I realized that she couldn't carry the public side of the story. And uh -huh. the more I read about it, he was spending even more time with Seward and Stanton and Chase and Bates than with Mary, married to them because of the perils of the war and the emotions of it. So I started reading about them. And then when I realized how incredible were the treasure troves of materials that they all had in their families, that's when I knew this yeah, is the story yeah, I want to yeah. tell. Uh, uh, by the by, Mary Lincoln didn't like the fact that Lincoln spent many nights in, before Seward's fireplace. Kibitzing would be the word we would no, use today. No, absolutely. She was very jealous. I yeah. mean, Seward is the most interesting character in some ways of the members of the cabinet because everyone thought he should have been president, including yeah. himself. Of course. And there's 10,000 people chase. waiting outside. Yes, yeah. 10,000 people waiting outside his home the champagne already uncorked, and it seemed like an irrecoverable disappointment. But once he got into the cabinet, he said Lincoln was unlike anyone he'd ever known. Yep. And yep. they become great friends, not simply allies, but great friends. Yep. You know, I, I think you said that in less than two months, uh, in other words, by June of 1861, Seward said Lincoln is the best of us. He quickly realized what a genius this man was. And once he realized that, he was big enough to put his own presidential hopes aside and to really settle in to becoming an historic Secretary of State. And Lincoln would go to his house at night. He went to the theater with him almost 100 times. Yeah. And it was really an important relationship because yeah. he could depend and trust yeah. on him. Yeah. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit uh, 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 with regard to Seward. Uh, Doris, uh, for me, most of us know nothing about William Seward. Uh, the only thing people know is that uh, he uh, purchased Alaska for the United States, which is known as uh, Seward's Folly, and that's about the sum total of most people's human beings, most human beings now, if they know that. Now, when one reads your book, one gets the most distinct impression, and, and I'm looking for your view on this, that William Seward was actually one of the great Americans of the 19th century. No question about that. You know, I think where I first began to feel his presence, his home still exists in Auburn, New York, and it's a private museum. And when you go through it, you see the impact that he had because his books are there, there's mementos on the wall, there's tributes to him from various characters. And he really was in, in, critical to Lincoln, not just as an advisor, but keeping England and France out of supporting the Confederacy, a very diplomatically difficult thing to do, which he did, and helping him with the emancipation, helping him with the first inaugural address. I yeah. mean, he's everywhere during yeah. this period of time yeah. and I think yeah. deserves to be remembered as a great yeah. American. And he was, of course, 
along with Chase, uh, probably two, uh, one of the two with Chase, most uh, prominent anti-slavery politicians from, what would you say, 1850 to 1860? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he gives his maiden speech in the Senate um, in 1850, and right away, Seward has become a nationally celebrated character, yeah, yeah. and really was in many ways one of the founders of the Republican Party. Yeah. That's why everyone thought he would be the, yeah. rewarded by getting yeah. that nomination, yeah. but people yeah. thought he was too radical yeah. in 1860, yeah. and Lincoln was in the middle of the yeah. party. Yeah, a, a subject that uh, we will discuss extensively. Uh, Chase, too was one of the founders of the Republican Party. In fact, Chase practically made a living going around finding, founding political parties, right? <laughs> well, he went from one party to yeah, the other. Yeah. I mean, Chase is an interesting figure because on the one hand, he's brilliant, and on the one hand, he's also very dedicated to the anti-slavery cause, very honored in the abolitionist community. And yet, on the other, he was so relentlessly ambitious for the presidency yeah, yeah. that even when he becomes Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury, he cannot give it up. Yeah. I think, in part, it came from the sadness in his private life, having yeah. three young wives who died. I mean, imagine what it's like. You're married, your first wife dies at 22 yeah. in childbirth, yeah. the next one at 25 of TB, the yeah. third one in her yeah. 30s. Yeah. And all that he's left with is a daughter who he grooms yeah. to be the first lady of the land. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, in that sort of vacuum, his desire for the presidency becomes un unending in yeah. a certain sense. Uh, you know, uh, Doris, uh, a few days ago over lunch, somebody, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, Kate Chase and what she had done, his daughter. And, and because life is so different today, People don't uh, die at early ages the way they, they died in droves at early ages because it wasn't until the revolution in medicine and from starting around 1870 or 75 that this all changed. So somebody said to me as if this were unnatural, you know, was this really uh, often happened that a daughter? But sure it did. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I mean, death cuts across all these families' lives in ways that it would be hard for us to imagine today. Yeah. I mean, look at Bates. Yeah. He has 17 children and then nine of them live. So that means yeah. he lost eight children. Yeah. So, I mean, it's an extraordinary thing that we have to, that's one of the ways you have to get back in that time to yeah. understand yeah. that death is more intimate to them than it is to us. Oh, absolutely. A cholera, typhus. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the common cold could be, well, anyway. Exactly. Um, why did Lincoln bring into his cabinet uh, the very cream of the crop in the Republican Party and, uh, uh, and ex-Democrats, the strongest characters, the strongest minds, the major politicians in the country, people who were far more prominent in some cases than he had been. Why did he do this? Well, it took an enormous self-confidence, number one, to do this because everybody assumed because they were so strong, he'd be a figurehead. They were better educated, better known than he. They all sh thought they should have been president instead yes, of him. Yes. But what he said, I think, was the truth. He said, these are the strongest men in the country. The country's in peril. I need them by my side. And I think he knew if he had all the factions of the Republican Party, and you're right, they had been former Democrats, former Whigs, um, former abolitionists, that somehow he could argue within his official family, then he would get a feeling for the country as a whole and keep his hand on the pulse of the country. Yeah. And yeah. he was right. It yeah. made him a much better president yeah. to have them, even though it meant for a lot of arguments inside yeah. the official family. Yeah. yeah. Now, that in itself is one of the perceptions that you bring out that's not widely known. But here's another one. I think it only has a paragraph in the book, but it is startling and relates to what you just said. There was a, a sort of a peace conference in 1861, which went nowhere. It was in uh, Washington. And you point out that while so many people thought Lincoln would be a figurehead, one fellow, a Virginian, name of William Rives, said, oh, these people have it all wrong. This guy's going to be his own man. He's going to think for himself. Why was Rives so perceptive? He just watched him inside the peace conference and out acts he dealt with everybody who came in first of all he had a clinton-esque ability to have a little word for each person that came in knowing his personality knowing his past remembering every face but more importantly he listened to the sort of authenticity in his voice i think when he spoke about the problem of the states seceding from the union and what he was going to do about it and this one guy you're absolutely right amongst all the others saw into lincoln it took the others a greater period of time to figure out this was an extraordinary man yeah. in their midst yeah. Well, those are fascinating comments because, uh, for example, Clinton-esque, oh boy. Uh, 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 <laughs> that part of Clinton. <laughs> that part. Of, it's true. We'll come into something else that happened that was very so The authenticity in his voice. How many times have we heard in the last few years that uh, in order to be a persuasive person, you have to believe in what you're saying and speak as if you believe in what you're saying? 
I, this was sort of like a new idea, I thought, in the last 20 years. It comes out of a, how do you persuade everybody to see it your way? It's sort of half phony, if you know what I right, mean. Right, right. But <clears throat> I saw it in Lincoln way back then, and you mentioned several times, I'd never put the two together, that Lincoln spoke with great earnestness, and people saw that in him. Yeah, when people would describe what kind of a speaker he was, evidently he had a thin, high-pitched voice, but amazingly, it could reach out. There's no microphones in those days, right? right? And there's 10,000 people gathered outside for one of these big speeches, and they can hear him at the far reaches of the crowd. But what everybody says is maybe he looked awkward when he started and his appearance was somewhat disheveled, but the yeah. minute he began to yeah. speak, he was speaking with such conviction, such emotional strength, that somehow he persuaded you that you believed that he believed what he was saying. Yeah. And that yeah. was his key. That was the key yeah. to his success. Yeah. yeah, And he probably did believe it. I think he did. Yeah, right. <laughs> it wasn't just put on yeah. like Andrew Carnegie, believe what you want to believe and yeah. say it. Yeah, his, his partner Herndon said it. And, you know, every, nobody really ever says this, but everything you read about Lincoln shows it, that he would say nada. He would not say word one until he had thoroughly studied a subject and felt that he had grasped it. Yeah, it's really true. He was afraid of any kind of spontaneous call for him to speak, even when he was president, and there'd be a battle that was won, and the crowd would be out calling for him to come to the balcony. And he was always afraid that he'd say something stupid if he hadn't prepared it. When you think of his brilliant mind, yeah. it shows how clearly he wanted to say everything. Yeah. So he would just say something like, I'm glad you're here, or yay for the soldiers, and then <laughs> wait until he could write out a speech and yeah. then deliver that yeah. kind of a speech. Yeah. Let's discuss, uh, let's turn... Uh, to the boyhoods and the uh, young professional uh, experiences of four of these people, uh, starting with Lincoln, then going into Seward and uh, Bates and Chase. Uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, the boyhood of Lincoln, because it's 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 something that one it just blows your mind to tell you the truth. You know, it really does. I mean, even as a child, I remember reading these young biographies of Lincoln and feeling this emotional identity with this poor kid who is trying to find books and he can't find them and he's reading by candlelight, but it's all true. It's not yeah. a mythological yeah. understanding of yeah. him. I mean, growing up in that frontier area, which he later said, and he had no romanticization about it. He thought it was a very hard place to grow up. He wanted so much to go to school and yet because his father needed him to work on the farm or he actually loaned him out to pay yeah. off debts to other like farmers a like a slave yeah. he then was only able to attend school one year he figured yeah. of total schooling yeah. but the idea that he would then get a book by scouring the countryside for it and be so excited when he had the book in hand that he couldn't sleep or he couldn't eat and reading at night waking up in the morning to read and eventually by reading Shakespeare and poetry and the best of the books. Maybe we read too much these days yeah, right, because he right. just read narrowly, but right. the best of literature, the Bible and Shakespeare in particular and poetry, those rhythms got implanted yeah. into his soul. Yeah. And then his mother dies when he's nine years old. And I think the hardest thing for and him his was... his sister later. And his sister died in childbirth not too long after that. And then his first love, Anne Rutledge, died. And he didn't seem to be able to get the comfort that most people in that generation had that he would see them in the afterlife. I mean, stories are always told that when somebody was dying in that period, they'd actually talk at the deathbed. Well, you're going to see your sister or your brother there, and don't worry, we'll be there soon. But Lincoln's mother, when she died, simply said to him, Abraham, as she was dying, I'm going away from you now, and I shall never return, not holding out that hope of heaven. Yeah. And I came away feeling that because of that, he was haunted by the idea that when you die, you become dust. So he developed this idea that if I can accomplish something worthy that will stand the test of time, then my life will live on in memory of other people. And boy, did he accomplish that. Yes, yes he did. Yes, he did. Uh, I've forgotten now, Doris, who it was that said, maybe Ward, Lam no, not Lamont, whoever it was who said, Lincoln was uh, a religious man, albeit not in the traditional sense of religion, but in, in what I frankly think are far more important senses. And it's an argument that's with us today. Absolutely. Why, why don't you why No, don't you're you right. It's Leonard that? Sweat, his good friend. And Leonard what Sweat, Sweat said was that if you judged Lincoln by the number of times he went to church and whether he joined an organized religion, then he might not be considered a religious man. But if you judged him by the ethical behavior of the way he handled people and the values that he brought into his life and the principles that he stood by, then he's the most religious man of all. And yeah. I think it's the way you conduct your life. I mean, that's what people who believe in God are hoping, too, that yes. it will help you to lead a better life here on Earth. Yes. And in that standard, Lincoln is way above most yeah, people. Yeah. And as I say, without belaboring it, uh, this, this is an argument that's going on today. 
given the rise of religious fundamentalism and the op its opposition to secularism and how the secular people do or do not react to it. The same argument Absolutely. 150 years later. No, in fact, he was hurt in his early campaigns when he was running for Congress by people charging him with being a deist like Jefferson was, right. which right. meant that he wasn't sure that God, he thought there was a force. Yeah. But I think later in his presidency when the war took such a toll, God became a more important person to yeah. him, and he certainly talked about him yeah. more in his speeches. Yeah. But yeah. as you say, and as I agree, it's the way he led his life that yeah. showed he was a religious yeah. person. But Doris, you, you say there is some evidence, and uh, having had an experience, a sort of opposite experience uh, of the same genre, uh, I was really thunderstruck by the fact that you said there is some evidence his father destroyed his books. Yeah, there's some thought that the father was jealous of the fact that Lincoln was spending so much time in intellectual pursuits because he himself could hardly read or write, and that it also was taking time away from his working on the farm. And then Lincoln would then, when he went out to work on the farm, start entertaining his little friends by telling them stories, climbing on a tree stump and recreate, recreating one of the books he'd read, thus taking those kids away from the work. So there's some people who've written that the father might have abused him at even did destroy some of his books and did have a fundamentally difficult relationship with yeah, his son. Yeah. And so much so that when the father lay dying much later, Lincoln did not go to visit him. And Lincoln yeah. forgave everybody everything, but this was the one person yeah, that something yeah, happened in yeah. that relationship that I, he I have had forgive. the sense, this is not part of your book, but obviously you know a lot about it. I have had the sense that, understandably to be sure, Lincoln was a little hard on his father because his father had an awfully tough life. I agree. I mean, it's the one thing that's almost inexplicable because he's so gentle in forgiving almost everybody else who's hurt him, and somehow he couldn't extend that generosity to the father. Yeah. So I, it's the one mystery that I still think needs to be solved about him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell a little bit about his stepmother, and, and I'll tell you what really fascinates me. Well, you, you go ahead. Uh, you go ahead and tell about it. Well, he was very lucky. What happened is after his mother died, his father left. Abe and his sister Sarah, who was only 12, for months while he went back to Kentucky to bring yeah. back a second wife. He was wife. only nine. Lincoln was only He's nine. He's only nine years yeah. old, and the sister is trying to take care of him. And when they came back with the new stepmother, Sarah, she said that they looked like wild animals, that yeah. they hadn't yeah. been fed right, they hadn't eaten right, they hadn't been clothed correctly. But she ended up loving Abraham, yeah. and she really, I think, was able to build a path for him with his father because she thought it was important for him to read. She never never made him do chores when she thought he could be broadening himself through reading. And he loved her. And yeah. I think she, 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 under, she said what little mind she had and his mind somehow ran on the same channels. Yeah. Yeah. So that became a very yeah. important relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> she actually lived to see this ragged urchin become right. a, the greatest man in the, in the <laughs> exactly. history. Exactly. And he went to see her right before yeah. he went to Washington. Yeah. And that was a pretty emotional moment oh, for the yeah. two of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like his farewell speech at Springfield. Oh. I know not whether I shall ever, etc. Incredible, right? I mean, you know, it's like he saw yeah. the future a lot. You had this yeah. feeling. He wasn't a morbid person, but he did seem to think at various points that this might not be a long life for him. Yeah. And yet he still forged yeah. on. Yeah. Like Mickey Mantle. Well, that's a bizarre <laughs> connection. <laughs> now you're getting as bad as me. <laughs> There's a bizarre Bringing baseball into everything. <laughs> you know, there, there, are, there are certain aspects of Lincoln's persona, Doris, that you bring out that simply are not generally brought out. Uh, and uh, they seem to be of the essence uh, of the man. His, the, the complete amiability of, of him as a person his roar of laughter. I've never heard it described that way, as a roar of laughter. And the idea, which you don't describe this way, but I have read it a a a as follows. He lived in his head. Can you expatiate, elaborate on those things You know, things for me, bit? I think the greatest and most pleasant surprise was to find out about his amiability. I think we've been so programmed to see him as the great emancipator and that monument in that incredible, beautiful statue in, in Washington. And all the pictures make him seem so stiff, and, and we do know that he was melancholy and he had a sadness about him. But when you read what other people said about him when they were in his presence, he would light up a room. The minute he walked in the room, 
he was the one when they were on the legal circuit like together. Clinton, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when he was on the legal circuit together with the other lawyers and the judges and the bailiffs, everybody, when they knew Lincoln was in town, in the tavern, would come from miles around. He would entertain them with stories for four or five hours. Yeah. And yeah. so suddenly when I saw that picture and they said he would laugh harder than everybody else and his whole face would light up, I realized that we were just seeing one picture of him because of still photography. If we had ever had moving pictures then, we'd have a whole different emotional feeling for this man because he came to life when he started talking. Yeah, and he had a tremendous uh, sensitivity and, and, and empathy for people. You know, uh, I don't think it's uh, politically incorrect to say that his sensitivity for people were not only uh, preternatural, it was feminine. Yes, I think that's right. No, in fact, you know what's really interesting? The qualities that I came to believe were the source of his political genius, his empathy, his sensitivity, his compassion, and his understanding of relationships, those are qualities that we normally associate with women. Yes. And yet he also had the kind of chutzpah to put himself forward in political yeah. life, which sometimes women haven't seemed to have over the ages. You know, that sense of, here I am, I'm going to run for president, even though nobody knows who I am. <laughs> so just, he combined both those qualities. Just, la just yesterday, the New York Times had a big article. They quoted a woman who's uh, a partner in a large New York law firm about that very point. Women don't thrust themselves forward and say, I want this and I want that. Right. It's a whole different way of acting. One last thing before break, because they're, you know. Uh, <laughs> w w one last thing before break. Uh, we don't hear this from anywhere else. I, I never knew this from anywhere else. But you speak of his whole face lighting up because he, it, you know, people had a very sad face. It was homely, it was sad, and all of a sudden when he was talking to somebody, it would just light up. And that's what people responded to. I mean, evidently, that's what I'm saying. He became a totally different looking person. No longer ugly, no longer awkward. You were transfixed by sort of the, the twinkle in his eyes, the smile that he had, yeah, the laughter yeah, that came out, yeah. and that throaty voice when he yeah. finally began to talk. Now, yeah. that's what, when people say to me, if you could be with him, what would you want to ask him about reconstruction or something? I say, no, I just say to him, Lincoln, tell me a story so I could watch his <laughs> face lighting up. <laughs> hey, absolutely. Yours does the same thing. Uh, but you're much better looking than Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no beard anyway. <laughs> well, I shouldn't speak badly about beards. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> we'll be right back, folks. Stay with us for the second segment of the first show with Doris Kearns Goodwin. moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. It takes a man to be a dad. Someone's belly. Yeah, probably lost it walking on the beach. Man, just leave it. Let's go. 
they've outgrown their toddler seat, they're still not ready for adult safety belts alone. Four foot nine is the magic number. Until then, kids need a booster seat. Make sure your little pumpkin gets there safely. Visit BoosterSeat.gov. Welcome back. Doris, you said that uh, here was this man who had a preternatural, even feminine sensitivity, and yet who put himself forward. Uh, and as part of putting himself forward, you, you make the point that as distinct from his rivals in the cabinet, this man always had to do everything for himself, from obtaining an education to running his own campaigns. Can you elaborate a little on that? Right. I think that's one of the things that in the end helped him very much. But at the time, it made things much more difficult for him. For example, Seward in New York had the boss of New York, Thurlow Weed, as his best friend, who would run his campaigns, who would figure out who the delegates were, who would bribe whatever he needed to do to get them yeah. to go for Seward. Yeah. And Seward could just sit back and wait until he won and then give a speech. Yeah. Um, Chase had people working for him. Bates did, too. But Lincoln had to do every step yeah. of the political yeah. process yeah. of his own. Yeah. But it meant that he was more absorbed in understanding the people because of yeah. that. This became a really big deal later. I, I, I think that one might compare it in a way, uh, the Seward-Weed relationship. It was in some ways like uh, the Jackie-Bobby relationship or uh, the Bill and Hillary relationship. Absolutely. I mean, it meant that Seward had a companion throughout his entire political life who was his mentor, who would be able to weave through difficult paths for him, who could push off other candidates. No, there's no question about it. Or yeah. maybe like Bush and Karl Rove in a Bush certain and sense Karl today. Uh, and who told him what to say and what not to say and when to say it and when not to say it. And actually when Seward got into trouble is when he didn't consult or didn't listen to Weed. That's right. I mean, yeah. Weed understood that Seward had instinctively radical tendencies during the 1850s. And at a certain point when Seward was making a speech where he called on the fact that there was a higher law than the Constitution that dedicated us to anti-slavery, yeah, we yeah, knew immediately, yeah, uh-oh, yeah, you yeah, shouldn't have said this. Yeah, and yeah. then he, he apologized, but it was too late. It yeah. got labeled to him. Yeah, yeah. Once, once it gets out there, you cannot take it <coughs> That's back. That's right. He also used a, another phrase that did the same thing, the irrepressible conflict. Exactly. I mean, yeah. he was right that the, irre that the slavery issue was an irrepressible conflict that would eventually lead to war. But in the 1850s, people didn't want to believe that. They still yeah. wanted to believe there was some compromise available. Uh, yeah, and Seward's wife, who uh, I think was good friends with Lucretia Mott right. and uh, Martha Wright Coffin, uh, Martha Coffin Wright. Martha Coffin Wright only lived 20 miles away or something like that. Uh, boy, she was a she was a total abolitionist, and she was oh. always pushing them in that direction. You know, she's an example, I think, of what happened to brilliant women in the 19th century who were frustrated because she was well educated. She read as deeply as Seward did. She was an abolitionist. She pushed him, almost like Eleanor pushed Franklin Roosevelt, to do yeah, what should yeah, be done rather yeah, than what could yeah, be done. Yeah. And yet she could never really go out on her own with her own ideas or even her own opinions. Yeah. And as a result, she developed, as so many of those women did, all these illnesses that were yeah. never completely explainable but were probably depression. Sure, and she was in sure, bed much of her sure. life, even though she had this brilliant brain. Yeah, it was all psychosomatic because it, it's just total frustration. Right, right. Uh, I mean, uh, years ago I, I read somewhere that you, a human being will turn on, inward on himself or herself if he doesn't have an outlet. This, this brain oh, will... Oh, how interesting. Yeah, I don't know if that's no, true. No, no, that, I think it's certainly true in her case because even she one time wrote an essay about women where she said you can't even run in the field with your child because remember you're wearing those ridiculous dresses that don't allow you to walk <laughs> right, and right. she thought you should be wearing better clothes. She was just way ahead of her time. Yeah, yes. Yes, she sure was. Um, now, when Lincoln started uh, in politics, one of the early things he did is he uh, got, a, got himself elected to first to the state legislature, which became uh, disastrous because of the Depression of 1837. Right. And then he got himself elected to Congress as uh, sort of a rotating basis with a couple of other guys. And uh, the way you put, put the matter is something like this. Lincoln said to us, well, you want me to make a splash here, so I'm going to make a splash. I'm going to uh, say some bad things about the way we got into this war with Mexico. 
And boy, that learned him. Oh, is that <laughs> true? Talk, that learned him, that. exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, it was his maiden speech in the Congress, and the Mexican-American War, he believed, had been started by President Polk really just to gain territory for the United States, and particularly to gain slavery territory for the United States. And so he questioned the president, um, why did you start the war in this place? And he said, Arnold, for questioning the war. Even he finally had to acknowledge, well, I did vote for supplies of the soldiers. <laughs> it sounded so familiar to the arguments yeah, of these we last heard this years. recently? Yeah. Exactly. But it meant that he really didn't have a chance to run for Congress again after that. And it looked for a while yeah, yeah. like his political career was yeah. over. You know, uh, uh, Doris, uh, back in the days of Vietnam, uh, this used to come up every now and again, what happened to Lincoln. And I cannot help thinking that uh, his experience was replicated by dissenters both in the time of Vietnam and in the time of Gulf War II. Do you, oh, there's he, no question. I remember when I was teaching the course on the presidency at Harvard in the height of the Vietnam War, and w I would use Lincoln's speech, you know, and the kids would just be amazed at the parallels between then and then. So it's yeah. true. I mean, you just go back, and that's the great thing about history. There are always echoes from the present into the past. Yeah. Doris, uh, uh, let me ask you a, sort of a, uh, this is off the wall in terms of this discussion, but may, uh, while history doesn't repeat itself, doesn't it have repeating patterns so that it, our refusal, uh, I use that word advisedly in this country, our refusal to learn about the past has disastrous consequences for the present and no future. No question about it. I mean, when you think about it, people go, I mean, human nature doesn't change fundamentally over time. So when we've had problems, whether they're war or peace or poverty or wealth or depressions or recessions, they've handled them. They've done things about them in the past that worked or didn't work. And why not look back? It's like an experiment. You can see what worked and didn't. And some of our best presidents do look back. I mean, when Teddy Roosevelt was facing the coal strike, he looked back and he read about Lincoln. When Truman was figuring out what to do about MacArthur, he looked back to Lincoln and McClellan. And Franklin Teddy. Roosevelt Teddy. would read about Lincoln and, and about Teddy Roosevelt. So, But I don't know how many of our presidents spend that much time, but they should. You would hope they would, and you'd hope the people around them would. One of my favorite remarks by Truman is, not all readers can be leaders, but all leaders must be readers. Oh, that's great. I haven't heard that. That's yeah. terrific. Yeah, yeah really I think that's so exactly that. right. Yeah. Tell, uh, if you would, uh, while we're uh, still on Seward. Are we still on Seward? Oh, I can stay on Seward. <laughs> I love Seward. <laughs> <laughs> Tell about his trip to Europe and the effect that had on him, and then his trip with Fanny, uh, with Francis. Fanny was his daughter, Francis right. his wife. His trip with Francis to the South and what happened on that trip and the effect that trip had on him. You know, the interesting thing about the trip to Europe is it just showed early on the enormous difference in the gulf between Lincoln and Seward because here he is a young man able to travel through all the this, all this countries in Europe and he keeps looking back at America's democracy while he's over there seeing monarchies and it only makes him appreciate even more what America stands for in the world, something that Lincoln later did too. And when you think about it, Lincoln could only travel to Europe in his mind by reading Shakespeare's plays. He went to England with the kings. Mm -hmm. By reading Lord Byron's poetry, he went to Spain and Portugal. Again, just showing the gulf between the much more privileged childhoods these other guys had than Lincoln did. But at a certain point, um, Seward went with Francis to the South. And again, he saw in the South the economic um, hurt that slavery was bringing to the area because aside from the plantations, a lot of the other houses were rotting, the streets were in disrepair, it didn't have the progress and the momentum that the industrial north had yeah. and he understood then that somehow something was going to have to change for the south to be yeah. brought into the yeah. union in a yeah. full partner. Yeah, you know they say that there were more banks in New York City or New York State than in all of the south. I'm sure that's right, yeah. I'm sure that's no right. No roads, that's right. I mean, no hospitals, no schools, really, essentially, no universities. I yeah. mean, there were a few, but nothing like there was in the North. Yeah, and in fact, they would come north to Princeton and so forth to go to college if they right. were privileged. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was in Mississippi on a Civil War trip about eight, nine years ago, and we were out around Gettysburg, Doris, and uh, we uh, visited some of the uh, still, uh, there's places, they're still in the boonies, they're, they're still standing by themselves, the poverty, the poverty. You can understand why the Arkansas state motto is thank God for Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. And that's yeah. what Seward saw even yeah. then. And Seward believed in progress and he had this optimistic temperament. So he just hoped if the economics could get into the South and slavery could be ended, then the whole country would take off in a way yeah. that it couldn't yeah. otherwise. Yeah.
Okay, give us one minute on Chase, his boyhood, his education. Well, uh, Chase came from a distinguished family in New England. He yes. had uncles who were senators. He had another uncle who was the Episcopal Bishop of Ohio. But his father died when he was young, and his mother needed to have him taken care of, so she sent him to this uncle in Ohio who was, even though a brilliant man, very tough on young Chase and, and almost like a martinet with him. So Chase developed, I think, early on some of that quality of repression and severity and no joy in life that he brought with him, but ambition. The guy wanted him to be ambitious, and he became so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it sounds very Puritanish. Very much so. I mean, he, he, he was very religious, and he didn't ever drink much. He never smoked. He thought novels were sinful. He thought theater was a waste of time. Right. He would right. spend his evenings practicing jokes that he could never deliver with ease <laughs> or, or studying a foreign language. Yeah, right, he would not right. have been the most fun guy to yeah. be around. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't want to have a beer with Sam. No, I don't think so. <laughs> and he, he hated his name, yeah. Sam and P. Chase. Yeah, he wanted to want change to have it at one with point. A beer exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, t tell me, uh, t tell us about, because this is. How many people in America know that Lincoln almost was elected as senator in 1855? The term would have begun in 1856. Right. Tell what happened. It's an amazing story and one with most important long-term consequences. No, absolutely. I mean, what happened is that he had been instrumental in creating the, um, the beginnings of the Republican Party in Illinois, and it was made up of former Whigs and former Democrats. And everybody thought he would be the one because he had created this thing to be given the senatorial nomination, which of course took place in the state legislature at that time. And he had like 47 votes for him, and this other candidate, Trumbull, had five votes for him. Trumbull had been a former Democrat. And, but his five votes would not go over to Lincoln. And Lincoln felt if he didn't somehow do something, the third candidate, who was more pro-slavery, would win the nomination. So he voluntarily gave his 47 votes to Trumbull's five votes to give Trumbull the Senate ship. Mary Lincoln never would speak to Mrs. Trumbull again, but Lincoln went that night to the celebration, and eventually Trumbull becomes Lincoln's great supporter. I mean, that's why it all comes round yeah. when you do and it. And Trumbull and, and a fellow who was supporting one of the five votes, a fellow named Judd, right. were two of the guys at the uh, Republican convention, were they not, in 1860, exactly. that, got, that put Lincoln across. That's right. So it yeah. just shows, if you can do like Lincoln, not hold grudges, when politics is all about human relationships, yeah. in the long run, it's going to come back to yeah. your benefit. But it takes an extraordinary person oh, to do my. that. I mean, I, I, I wonder whether you'll find another example in American history. Of somebody I, I who don't would think do so, it. because the kind of people who go into public life now, I think, are not going to easily have that kind of quality because it's sort yeah. of bred out of them, given how yeah. tough the political system yeah. is now. Yeah, yeah. Now, in about the two and a half minutes that are left for this segment, Doris, uh, explain the uh, fascinating ways the planning that Lincoln did to win the nomination. This guy didn't come out of the blue like people tend to think. Isn't oh, absolutely. Blue, no, uh, no, that's exactly right. I mean, people just think it was just a, the fact that he was in the middle of the party and they just turned to him. That's really not so. He had figured this out better than the other guys, much more experienced than him. Number one, he knew that each one of his three rivals had certain enemies and that they might have people that were not going to be happy about them running for the office. So he deliberately said, let me be your second love. If you have to turn away from your first love, can you imagine that's a humble thing to do? Come to me as your second love. Number two, he understood the importance of having the convention in Chicago. What happened is in the meeting, where could the convention take place? Seward's people wanted in New York, Bates is in Missouri, Chase is in Ohio. So he had his guy there say, hey, how about Illinois? There's no front runner in Illinois. And then once he had it in Chicago, he got the trains to give free passageway to all of his supporters to get to Chicago. And on the day of the balloting, actually, he actually had printed duplicate ballots, duplicate tickets to get into the convention hall so all of his supporters could out yell Seward supporters. So he was figuring out every step along the way. Plus, he positioned himself. It was a truthful positioning in the middle where Seward was more radical, Chase more radical, Bates more conservative. So Lincoln was the man who could win. I have to say, Doris, I, I just can't stop myself from saying, Duplicate tickets, it sounds like Mayor Daley. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there are certainly times when he yeah. is being a politician, yeah. canny and understanding, um, as long as the end result is something positive. And he never did anything illegal, as far as I know. I mean, yeah. but every law was so loose at that yeah. time. Yeah. He just let yeah. more people in that yeah. were supporting yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> and, and one of the things that really made a big difference was uh, the, the, the Republicans, because the South is going to be solid. 
Right, right. The Republicans had to win the lower tier of northern states, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, uh, and, and, and tell what Lincoln and his people did in order to win that tier of states. Yeah, well, those are the battleground states, as he yeah. called them. So he knew, first of all, that Indiana would be the first one to get. And so he had an old friend from the Congress there, Mr. Smith. So there was a promise, I think, that Smith might get some job in the cabinet. Then there was Pennsylvania, and there was Mr. Cameron, the boss of Pennsylvania. And there was possibly a promise that Mr. Cameron might get some yeah. position in the cabinet. They were all promising everybody, yeah. so that wasn't unusual. Yeah. But he picked the right people and then was able to get those battleground states. And once he had them, that was really the key to the election. Yeah. And, and we're supposed to go to a break, but I want to pursue this for a while. Uh, you know, Lincoln said to uh, Judd and, and such like David Davids, uh, do not commit me. Right. <laughs> He's not here. He doesn't know what it, what's going on. Exactly. And so they committed him, and all the, there's all these promises that everybody was going to be in the cabinet and so on. Now, at the same time that Lincoln <clears throat> was carefully planning out his strategy, uh, Chase and Bates and Seward particularly were making horrendous mistakes. That's exactly right. Elaborate that Well, Seward, for one, in the nine months prior to the convention, went to Europe for yet another trip to Europe. Weed, his buddy, was afraid he might say something again that would get yeah, him in trouble. Yeah, crazy. So go over. And he, meanwhile, he's visiting with kings and queens, yeah. and they think they're seeing the next president. But meanwhile, Lincoln was using those nine months to go around the country giving speeches and beginning to build up a political base. And meanwhile, Chase had made enemies in the past over his time, which Lincoln had never really done, yeah. and he never was able to sew up those enemies before yeah. the election took place, the nomination. Yeah. And Bates, meanwhile, was trying to figure out how he could seem to be less conservative, so he made some statements that made him seem more liberal, and then the conservatives got screwed up. They were mad at him for that, so he got lost on both sides. So yeah. they all made mistakes while yeah. Lincoln just almost brilliantly moved step by yeah, step yeah. toward getting that nomination. And when Seward came back, he made a speech which most people, his wife included, prominently, uh, thought was way too conciliatory right. to the South, so he sort of aggravated his own base Exactly, at that point. exactly. So yeah. it was as if they were the novices and Lincoln was the experienced person, even though it was the other way around. Isn't that amazing? Isn't Absolutely. that just amazing? All right, we, uh, we have to uh, go to our second break. Stay with us. We will uh, come back after a short break for the third segment of our first show with Doris Kearns Goodwin about her wonderful book, Team of Rivals. Can I ask a few questions about the apartment on Park Street? What was your name? My name, uh, my name is Juan Hernandez. It's been rented. Oh, it's gone. Hello, my name is Sanjay Kumar. I am calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's not available. Not available? Hello, my name is Tyrone Washington. I'm calling about the apartment on Park Street. Just been rented. Hello, I am Chen Lin. My name is Khalid Bin Ali. I'm Tuan Vo. Hello, my name is Moshe Goldberg. I use a wheelchair. It's gone. Not available. All right. Thank you. Yes, hello. My name is Graham Wellington. I'm calling about the apartment for rent on Park Street. Is that still available? Yes, it is. Oh, it is? Yes. Really? Housing discrimination is illegal. If you think you've been a victim because of your race, color, national origin, sex, religion, disability, or family status, call us. Fair housing. It's not an option. It's the law. There is really only one boy. One girl. One tree. One forest. One deep dancing ocean. One mountain calling. One handful of sand through our fingers. One endless sky overhead. And one simple way to care for it all. Please visit earthshare.org and learn how the world's leading environmental groups are working together under one name. Earthshare. One environment. One simple way to care for it. 
course, tell a little bit about the campaign of uh, 1860, uh, particularly at the speechifying that was done by Seward and, uh, by, and what Douglas did. Let's start with those two things. Well, in those days, it wasn't considered dignified for candidates to go stump on their own behalf. So Lincoln stayed in Illinois and had Seward substitute for him, really, running around the country. Douglas, the candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency, did stump for himself, which was considered unprecedented at the time. So he went to the South and the border states. But Seward roamed around from a whistle-stop tour, much like Harry Truman's right. later. Right. And the incredible thing, you would read that the applause and the crowds that he got, almost as if people were thinking that he was going to be the candidate as right. opposed to Lincoln. And he would speak sometimes to 20,000 people, 30,000, 50,000. They'd come on parades. There'd yeah. be girls dressed up. And somehow voices could carry in the open air there. It's hard to imagine. No microphones. And yet people at the far reaches could hear what he was saying. And Lincoln was always grateful to him for that yeah. because it, it rallied the base yeah. in a certain yeah. sense. But it must be global warming. That's, uh. Maybe. Or maybe the buildings <laughs> that are there. You know, who knows? But the air, I guess, was... Yeah. Clearer. <laughs> <laughs> and Chase, uh, despite his bitterness at uh, losing, uh, he made speeches. That's right. I mean, the, and, and even Bates wrote a letter on behalf of Lincoln that was then widely reprinted. Well, they all knew, obviously, that by the time Lincoln had won the nomination and before the election, they're, they're, they could see that the South was beginning to get more and more angry yeah, and yeah, more upset. Yeah, so yeah. they did pull together. Yeah. You know, Doris, one thing that fascinated me when I was a, when I was a kid at least in the Midwest, there, uh, and not among everybody, but among many people, there was an ethos of one does not want vote for oneself. In fact, years after the fact, I learned that a cousin of mine had lost a very important position by one vote and it had been his own vote. Oh, I didn't realize that that still existed, that ethos. How as, interesting. As late as the it 50s. certainly did for Lincoln. As yeah. late as the 50s. Wow. A and, and, and explain that little s vignette about Lincoln cutting off the top of the ballot. Yeah, when Lincoln first was going into the balloting booth for himself when he was running for president, he was afraid he couldn't vote for the whole ticket because he couldn't vote for himself. But one of his friends suggested, well, why don't you just cut your name off the top and then yeah. you can vote for the rest of the yeah. ticket, which yeah. is exactly what he did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and anybody who follows that ethos in America today is going to get nowhere. I mean, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's impossible. Can yeah. you imagine yeah. when we see them on voting days going into the booth yeah. and the idea that they're not voting for themselves? <laughs> no way. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Now, uh, as soon as the election was over, he, he made his decisions... Uh, on the cabinet. They didn't all work out exactly as he first planned, but the plan was mirrored. And, and uh, uh, one of the great frustrations, I guess, at the time was that Chase and Weed, and Weed asked, we went to Springfield to talk. They thought they were going to pick the cabinet. Right. Turned out not to be so. No, that, I think they, they, in those days, you know, they thought since Lincoln was so weak, that they could just put in whomever they wanted to and they would actually run this figurehead. No. But when we got to visit Lincoln in Springfield, he saw immediately, no, this is not a man who's going to be controlled. And he went back and he told Seward that. And then there was some question in Seward's mind about whether he should take the job because he thought at first, I'm taking it because I'll control him. And then when Seward saw that he had put a lot of Seward's enemies into the cabinet, it wasn't just that they were all enemies of Lincoln. They were all enemies to one another. I mean, Seward and Chase hated each other. Yeah. And then they didn't think Bates was good <clears> enough. <throat> so he had a, a real fiery group there together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, well, you explained before why he did it. And f how shall I put this? By clever machination, but that's not a good word, uh, but by, by dealing with them in a clever and intelligent way, Lincoln ultimately got them all to agree to join the cabinet. No, that's exactly right. I mean, yeah. at one point when it looked right about when he was about to be inaugurated that Seward was going to decline, and, st and, he, and he, Seward was going to decline if Chase were in. He was using it as a bluff in a way. Uh -huh. He then tells Seward's friends, well, Chase is staying in, and if Seward doesn't want a cabinet post, I'll send him to the ambassadorship or what that, at that time, the court of St. James in, yeah. in England. And then <coughs> Seward knew, uh-oh, yeah. I better be in there to counter Chase. So he gets yeah. them both to come yeah. at the same yeah. time. Yeah. That was, uh, you know, the ambassadorship could be, or in those days, ministry. Ministry, right. Yeah, it, it'd be purgatory because when he had to get rid of Cameron, he sent him to Moscow I know, exactly. Or St. Petersburg. Can you imagine <laughs> what it was like to be in St. Petersburg yeah. at that time? <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, you know, uh, here's another thing you bring out. Uh, I, I bet you not one hundredth of one percent of the American population knows this. Um, Stanton, who was a Democrat, actually joined Buchanan's cabinet in the last year or so, and he was so horrified at what he was seeing that he opened a back channel secretly 
to three of the people who ended up in, in uh, individually. They, uh, none, none knew that he was doing right, it. Right. And it reads like a deep throat story, the way, the way this was going out. Why don't you explain why that happened and how it happened? Yeah, I mean, Stanton was worried that Buchanan was so weak that even as the southern states were seceding, that the forts needed to be fortified, Fort Sumter, as it would turn out, and other forts. And he figured he had to somehow get the word up to the congressional people on the Hill. So he would meet under lamp posts, you know, yeah. with Seward's agents, and notes would be given to Seward that Seward yeah. would then send eventually to Lincoln. I mean, it's a great story. Of, it is like a deep throat story. Yeah. Yeah. And it meant that Stanton was able to have a larger loyalty to the country versus the loyalty to Buchanan, which yeah. people then criticized him for. Can you do that while you're in a cabinet? Yeah. But I think he, he was doing the right thing at the time. When did it become known that he had done this? Oh, it wasn't until decades later, I oh. think, when some of that information came out. Although there was some suspicion always of Stanton because he seemed to be a two-faced kind of guy. I mean, that's one of the most amazing stories that Lincoln put him in the cabinet in the first place after Stanton had humiliated him yeah. in 1855 in that lawsuit where yeah. Stanton yeah. was the big guy and Lincoln the little guy. Yeah. And he took one look at Lincoln and was afraid that Lincoln's appearance would hurt the case, so he yeah. turned his back on him. Yeah. And Lincoln was so humiliated, he didn't even want to go back to Cincinnati again. But then yeah. later, yeah. when he's told Stanton's the best man for this job, he puts him in the job. Again, an yeah. amazing decision because it turned out to be a great Secretary of War. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you say, uh, I mean, reading your book, it strikes me that if one thinks of the Secretary of War as being the de facto equivalent of what is today the Secretary of Defense, although there was a separate Secretary of the Navy, Stanton might have been the greatest Secretary of War or Defense we have ever had. I agree. I mean, when you think about having to organize and discipline and raise that army and get its supplies and get it in place and help with the strategy of the war, um, and he was indefatigable. I mean, he worked 20 hours a day. He was hard on his subordinates, but harder on himself, and, and became a great. I mean, that's the thing. Lincoln gave each of these men, by bringing them to his cabinet, a place in history. Yeah. That they yeah. would never, I mean, they're remembered because of him. Yeah. I mean, that's what's so yeah. amazing. They think he's a figurehead. They think they should be president. Chase and Stanton and Seward and Bates, we wouldn't know them. We might read about them in local yeah, histories, yeah. but they've become historic figures because of Lincoln. Uh, I have to say, George, that uh, I think that uh, their, the historical, historicalness uh, of these men uh, just received a tremendous boost from this book. You know, well, I hope so, because they're very large figures, and they deserve to be remembered in history, and not yeah. simply, as we said earlier, Seward's yeah. folly, or not yeah. simply Chase because yeah. he was the Secretary of the Treasury. They were larger than almost anyone on our current scene today, yeah. just to show how huge Lincoln is to be bigger than all of them together. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, Tolstoy, and we'll get to that. Um, before he took off, between the election uh, and the time he took off, Lincoln would say nothing, lest he make the situation worse. Uh, but he got Seward to introduce compromise resolutions uh, that Lincoln was not associated with. Uh, so why don't you, ex and the end result was that Stuart, they accomplished nothing, but Seward got a lot of heat while Lincoln looked like the uncompromising guy, a print, man of principle. Why don't you talk about that well, just Well, I mean, the, the difficulty that Lincoln's facing in that period between his election and March 4th, I mean, it was terrible that there were too many months there, is that the country's falling apart, and he's wondering, is there some compromise that can prevent war? But on the other hand, the Republicans who've elected him want him to stand firm on principle with no compromise. So what he does is have Seward introduce some ideas of his own for compromise. The, the hardcore Republicans refuse to pass it, and you're absolutely right. Then Seward gets blamed as if he's too conciliatory, and Lincoln's standing there as the principled man. Yeah. But again, that was part of the dance between Seward and Lincoln that both men understood, and I think Lincoln ends up respecting Seward all the more for taking the heat on a situation like that. Now, now uh, it was at this point that... Uh, I had a question, Doris, because, you know, I personally think of Lincoln as, as the greatest American, and that's not an unusual view. So my wife, uh, I mentioned to my wife the question I'm about to ask, and my wife took me to task, and so on and so forth. <laughs> you should never talk to your wife, uh, <laughs> unless your name's Richard Goodwin. Uh, um, you know, there were aspects of Lincoln that you talk about, and this business about uh, putting Chase up, uh, putting Seward up to it, well, nobody knows that you're the guy uh, who deserves the blame. Lincoln wasn't always the man of uh, principle and idealism that uh, we think of, some of us think of him. 
mean, there were times when he was a pretty sneaky politician, weren't there? I mean, I think what you could say, he was canny and shrewd as a politician. And yes, he did understand that any kind of political action is going to involve certain maneuverings. There's no question. That's what I found so fascinating. We think of him as the statesman, and he is. But he was a brilliant politician, and that's what politicians do sometimes. Yeah. They run for cover. Some, I mean, <laughs> eventually, when somebody did something in the administration, however, that was a mistake, he would often shoulder the responsibility yes, for yes, them. Yes. I mean, on the big things, he At would stand he up. he really wasn't responsible. <coughs> exactly. And yeah. he would acknowledge errors that he made. But in some of these kind of smaller situations, he understood. I mean, he brought weed in at a certain point. He needed money in an election, and somehow yeah. weed raises the money yeah. privately, and it this gets there. This is like there. a checkers fund. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So he, he knew that the end result sometimes required things that may not have been seeing the light of day, but it was never anything that hurt another person yeah. fundamentally. One, one, about a, one, one of these, well, the checkers fund hurt the opponents who lost. <laughs> yeah, so that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they had their own money. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're not that <coughs> <laughs> uh, One thing that's really uh, interesting, and, and this uh, struck, struck me as Clinton-esque, was, uh, but in a very, very vital American cause, was uh, when he uh, when he 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 denied that there were any peace commissioners in this in Washington. Why don't you tell that story? Exactly. I mean, what happened is they were <laughs> just about to get the um, amendment passed, ending slavery forever, which was a critical thing, the Thirteenth Amendment yeah. to him. And there was some thought that, in he, meanwhile, there's some police co um, peace commissioners coming from the South to Washington. And there was some thought if the Congress knew that, they wouldn't pass the amendment because they just stopped and everything that was in the because There was no way there was going to be peace. There was no way there was yeah, going to be peace. Yeah. So the rumor came out that they, were on, that they were in Washington. So he was able to split the sentence and say, no, there are no peace commissioners in Washington. They were actually on their way <laughs> to yeah. Washington. Right. So yeah. it was what, you yeah. know, what is, is, exactly. or whatever it is Clinton exactly. said. Exactly. But it allowed this 13th Amendment to pass, yeah. which yeah. was critical. And that yeah. was his legacy in a way, because he knew that yeah. by the Emancipation Proclamation only lasted as long as the war lasted. So it was critical to get that amendment passed that would end slavery yeah. forever. Speaking of, speaking of that fact, the Emancipation Proclamation goes. Another thing not widely known that you talk about is that during the court, but before the Emancipation Proclamation, Congress passed two different emancipation laws. Everybody kind of shrugged and went back to work, so to speak. Why did the, did, when Lincoln did it, why did it have so much bigger an impact? Because after all, like the previous ones, his Emancipation Proclamation was going to free nobody in the South until, unless and until the war was won. You know, it's interesting because some people even today look at it and say, well, it didn't do anything, because exactly as you said, the only people it covered were the people in the South, because he thought only his commander-in-chief war powers could cover the slaves in the South who were being used by the Confederates to help the Confederate cause. So he could argue that by freeing them and allowing them to hopefully come to the North or at least get out of the battles, he was helping the cause of the North. And as commander-in-chief, he had those powers. But the fact was that even just the announcing of that proclamation had a moral impact and an emotional impact on the North that I'm not sure even Lincoln fully understood that it would. Seward never understood that. He thought it was right. just a proclamation. Why are you doing it? But it somehow... Also on Britain, on the working class. And it had an effect on the working yeah. class in Britain because the British working class were the ones that were being hurt by cotton not being shipped. And yeah. so the, the ruling class in Britain wanted to support the Confederacy to get their cotton back. But the working class were pro-emancipation. So it, it really had a bigger impact, I think, morally and emotionally than even the guys realized yeah. at the time. And it was huge yeah. at the time. A and the previous ones just didn't have that impact. No, well, one was in the District of Columbia. And they were minor things. But when a president announced it, yeah. and the way he did dramatically, um, it was a yeah. great moment when he yeah. signed it. Yeah. And that moment when he was afraid that his hand was shaking yeah. too much because he had shaken so many hands that day. Yeah. It was a New Year's yeah. Day reception. Yeah. So yeah. he said, wait, if I'm ever going to be remembered in history, it'll be for this act. I can't be shaking or people will think I hesitated and my whole soul is in it. Yeah. And then he signed with a bold yeah. hand. Yeah. The people up at the Tremont Temple in Boston, when the word finally came over the wires at 10 o'clock, because they thought he may, maybe had chickened out That's at the That's right. End. Frederick Douglass was there. And when they finally heard the word on the telegraph that, in fact, he had signed it, huge celebration yeah. into the dawn hours yeah. of the next yeah. day. Yeah, we have to wrap it up. But we've gotten through the, uh, our aliquo half. The <laughs> we have half, indeed. <laughs> and we'll finish off, finish the rest of it. The absolutely fascinating stuff the next time. Thank oh, you. I'd be delighted Thank to. You. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Be with us again next time for the next show uh, in Books of Our Time. Thank you.